everybody. Uh, really happy to be here in my hometown of San Jose at this conference. Uh, and I'm bringing up four women that um, we've uh, worked with in various ways over the last few years. And I'm just going to introduce them briefly and then let them introduce themselves in the context of what kind of businesses they've run with, what kind of funding over the last few years. So on the very end is Sana Choudhury. And she actually uh, runs Yenzen, which is, um, I think, unique amongst the folks on this panel. It's an accelerator and incubator for mobile and gaming companies. So she's got both, she's both an entrepreneur herself, but she's also in the business of helping entrepreneurs. We have Barb Dibwad. Barb is, I've known Barb for nine years probably, one of the web entrepreneur pioneers and original um, uh, gadget editor, correct? with them through the acquisition by AOL. She went off and started with some co-founders Tekka, which was a different model of online tech media. She's now back full circle. But she has seen a lot in the last years of covering, not only being part of the tech media entrepreneurism uh, cycle, but covering it. Uh, we have Esther Crawford. Uh, Esther is a great story because she came to a block her did an event for entrepreneurial women in 2011. It was a place to kind of spark your big idea. She came with her idea, and by that was in March of 11, and by August of 11, she was launching her product at the blog, her annual conference, for 4,000 people. Um, and so that was a wonderful sort of full circle experience as well. But she's, she's a serial entrepreneur, I think she qualifies as now, and is on to another project which she'll talk about. She's been through the wars a bit. And Michelle McGoffin is both, um, she's one of those people who took the le leap from corporate into entrepreneurism. Um, you know, without a net, so to speak. So a lot of us I know when we start, we're still working for companies and we have this idea and we do it on the side. She started out that way and then she made that leap and she's both, uh, a, has her own startup company, is also consulting and kind of trying to support it all together. So all, there's a lot of examples here of how we get started as entrepreneurs and how we get funded. Um, I'll kick off the, just by talking about how Blood Her um, happened. Blogger actually was founded in early 2005 by two co-founders, Lisa Stone and Joy Desjardins. We were not actually friends or colleagues. I met Lisa through a mutual friend, and I met Jory sitting next to her at a conference. And we got this idea and decided to work together to have a conference, a tech and blogging conference, where all the experts were women. And uh, we did the whole first thing without being a company, without, you know, we put our credit cards down to reserve the space. Um, and it was after the first conference that we sat down and said, huh, maybe we should be a company and maybe there's an opportunity here. At that point, we formed a company and we bootstrapped for two years. We paid a lot of other people before we paid ourselves regularly. I may not have taken a small business loan, but I lived a little bit off my home equity line of credit, I will be honest, and credit card debt, um, and, and wiped out my life savings. And then we finally did go the venture funding route. And we'll talk a little bit about what's the demarcation point where you decide that that's the step you want to take. So at this point, we've done four rounds of funding, uh, and hopefully four that's final. <laughs> that's the, the last round of funding, the last one. Um, and so we basically worked with strategic investors and more traditional VCs along this route uh, of getting these rounds of funding. And we've done a little debt as well, as most companies end up doing some debt equity that helps them kind of bridge the gap of receivables. So we'll talk about all of that, but maybe I'll start with you, Sana, and you can talk a little bit about both your own, how you funded businesses you've run, but also what you help companies who work in Yezin do. Right. Um, so thanks, first off, for having us here. This is great uh, to see some familiar places, both in the audience and the panel. Um, so Yezin, real quickly, has never actually taken any asset funding. Um, we do have a lot of VCs on board, so people tend to think that all those VCs have invested in us. But the way the Yetizen Accelerator works is it is underwritten by the second arm of our business, which is the Yetizen Innovation Lab. It's a 20,000 square foot space, which is a collaborative space for game developers. and has a little over 150 events a year for game developers to learn about the business of games. Uh, our main model there is sponsorships, space sponsorships. Uh, we don't necessarily charge the developers anything. And that's actually what runs the entire operations of the accelerator. It pays for staff salaries, it pays for everything else. Now, within the accelerator portfolio itself, uh, we have a variety of different types of funding, all the way from angel funding to currently there's a Kickstarter campaign running for one of our portfolio companies 
to venture uh, to strategics, we have a pretty large network there that a lot of our companies work with, and we know intimately so kind of know what each of those players is looking for. Uh, games is a bit of a different space than a lot of what uh, some of you guys may actually be working on. And in games, venture financing comes much, much later after a lot more traction. So typically, what we recommend to companies that haven't already gotten that angel funding or are not profitable is that you need to get to profitability fast. Because when you are going for venture, you want to go for venture uh, at the point where you're looking to scale, not at the point of survival, right? No one in venture ever gives you cash for survival. They'll give you cash to scale your current operations. So that's a model that's worked really well. Um, and of our 30 companies, all of them have raised some amount of funding to this point. And uh, none of them, I'm proud to say, uh, at least after being at the accelerator, we're raising it. Oh, no, we're going we're gonna to have to close shop if we don't get uh, cash in the next few months. Awesome. Uh, Barb Dewad, a currently Director of Business Development for Engadget.com, uh, the largest consumer tech blog on the internet. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, we're owned by AOL uh, as a result of an acquisition that I was a part of in 2005, although I haven't been uh, with the company contiguously since then. have been working primarily in tech and tech media for most of my career and essentially sort of ping-ponging between the startup world and, and entrepreneurial mode and the corporate world and sort of intrapreneurial mode. Uh, and all of the startups that I have worked with have been traditionally VC funded with the exception of Mashable. Uh, where I was uh, an editor for, for a stint, which has the distinction of being started out of Pete Cashmore's parents' basement and never <laughs> needed to take on any funding, and now are sitting fairly pretty as a successful company, not necessarily uh, in need of an exit, per se. Uh, and then the my most recent startup uh, was another consumer tech play, uh, mainstream, a technology website. We were funded by Best Buy, and that was uh, managed out of a fund run by a firm called uh, Fuse Capital. And one of the big lessons that I took away from that experience was around the potential drawbacks and pitfalls of having a single funding source and how much sort of control that gives them over your business and the, some of the decisions that you're able to make. Um, so hopefully we'll have a little more time to talk about that. I'm Esther. Uh, I'm currently working on two businesses. Uh, one is a subscription-based service called Yardstick, and it connects dieters with weight loss coaches. Um, the other one is an app that it, it's in the family tech space called Blanket, and it connects parents to each other specifically around scheduling and, and um, sharing private memories of your kids' lives. And um, over the last few years, I've bootstrapped primarily um, the companies I've launched, and I just recently closed my very first angel round. So um, I'm very Congratulations. Yes. It's very exciting. Um, so those are the two sources of funding that I've used. I'm Michelle McGoffin. I left the corporate world, like Elisa said, in June of last year to go out on my own. I started two companies at the same time. Uh, Bossy Interactive is my digital strategy consulting agency. And then I also started a mobile app development company called Sprawl3, which I started with two partners. And um, through Sprawl3, we are bootstrapped, but we operate on sort of a hybrid model agency. We develop our own apps. We develop white label mobile apps for small businesses. And to fund our own app development, we take on um, custom client work as well. So we develop mobile apps for other people. Just enough to make enough money so we can do our own stuff. And we cycle back and forth through that. Great, thanks. So let me ask those of you in the audience, how many of you are currently seeking funding for a business? How many of you have already gone this, are venture funded, have a venture, or have done a venture funded company? How many of you have worked with angels? And how many of you uh, have only bootstrapped or friends and family kind of borrowed money, debt? Yeah? Great. 
So, I mean, I think one of the most, and by the way, you guys have questions during, let's just do it. Like, I don't care about saving it for the end or anything. Let's, like, ask the questions anytime. Because um, we're, we're a group, I think we can manage that with the size. So, I think one of the toughest decisions any entrepreneur makes is when is it time to take funding? Um, because taking funding is necessarily dilutive to your ownership. So Mashable, that's a, I mean, I felt a little cringe in my stomach just hearing that story, like that rat bastard. I mean, that's like the dream, and that happens to almost nobody. So, you know, whether, whether it's debt, whether it's um, angel, whether it's um, um, venture, you know, you're diluting your ownership, you're giving up control to varying degrees. So one of the biggest decisions is, do you even seek that outside funding? When should you just tough it out? And Sana, you said right off the bat, the thing I think is so important, which is that people give you money to scale, not to survive. And if there's anything I hear kind of repeatedly from my colleagues who are investors, is that people walk in with stories of how they want to get funding so they can draw a salary. Or they want to get funding so they can not work so hard or not be so tired. And like myth number one is once you get funding, now you have these masters, you're going to work pretty hard, feel pretty tired, mm -hmm. trying to deliver on your promises for them anyway. But number two, nobody's going to give you money for that, right? So you know, maybe um, we can start by saying, you know, why, why does anybody give you money? And is it different between why an angel would give you money versus why a VC would give you money? Are their expert expectations different? And, um, should you, be, should you know what you're signing on for? And, and I kind of feel like the angel and VC model is kind of blurry now. It used to be pretty clear that up to a certain dollar amount, VCs didn't get involved and vice versa. But now VCs have these emerging angel arms and angels are giving more money. Um, maybe, Sana, I'll start with you. Do, you. do you see a lot of difference now do you, in both what they'll fund and, and the expectations they may have? Um, so I think traditionally angels came in earlier, pre-product, right? They, um, they're the ones who are betting on you uh, as a team, something for, because of the fact that you're working on something exciting, something potentially disruptive. But when they're looking at their outcome, what they're investing for you in, it's usually a much smaller exit amount, right? Uh, 40 million, 50 million, that's, that's a good deal for, for an angel, right? Uh, VCs typically, depending on the size of their fund and the economics of their fund, need a much, much bigger exit amount, right? And um, that's why you hear the very famous line, are you a bill, you know, do you have a billion dollar valuation? Are you the next billion dollar company, otherwise I won't fund you, right? Or you're doing well, you're profitable, but of the 18 companies in my portfolio, you're not one of the two that's gonna be that billion dollar exit, so I'm gonna pull the plug and not give you any money anymore, right? Um, I think what, what we're seeing now is that uh, there, was a t there was a set of typical late stage VCs, there was a set of early stage VCs, and then all of them start realizing they're losing a lot of valuable deal flow. So the early stage VCs are like, wait, the angels are funding it, and the, the, the amount of money these entrepreneurs need, they're, they're good with the angels, they don't actually see the value in us, we don't have the brand rep with them, what's the value we're providing, let's actually come earlier stage. So those VCs started get, having those angel arms, a lot of them evolved into some kind of micro VC as well. Uh, they're having seed arms so that they have the relationship with you to do follow-on investments at that later stage, right? I also um, think there's a lot more quick turn, kind of aqua hire, like, I mean, VCs in general do want a pretty quick turn, meaning three years maybe they want, but now there's even, for some kinds of companies, there's a quicker turn happening, but at a yeah. smaller Yeah, and so, so I think the smaller dollar amount is still difficult for them to be able to negotiate with their LPs. Um, but the fact that they're they're coming in earlier stage and following the way through and actually having you in that you know getting a chance to be in your Series A because they're part of your seed that's yeah. something that's become more and more valuable and they also don't want to lose out to this entire cadre of companies who're saying we're not going to build to be something extremely big we're just going to get angel financing or a micro VC and and never go there so they want to be able to influence companies that could have that outcome it's like hey, are you sure you don't want to go for that outcome? Because that's the only time you'll get a payout. Right. The well, liquidation preferences I have in your cap table. <laughs> and the IPO market is so different as well, that that method of exit is, is attainable for so far fewer companies. You know, we've lost the entire small to mid IPO opportunity, so right. you've got to go for that. You know, I was wondering, Barb, when Best Buy was working through a capital 
firm, but them being a public company working through a capital firm, I mean, that's, that struck me when you told me originally that it was kind of unusual. Um, but I actually do think there are more uh, companies who are getting into the venture business. In fact, there are companies opening offices in Silicon Valley, um, sometimes to do investment, sometimes I think looking to acquire. And we're talking about CPG companies. We're talking about retail companies. It's really fascinating to me what's going on with, with folks like P&G or Walmart or, you know, Comcast. Com well, yes, Comcast is one of our investors. Full disclosure. Um, so, um, who have these business development arms that are really venture arms. So, having worked with Engadget's original VCs and then working through Tekka's uh, corporate based, do they have different um, considerations or requirements? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, Weblogs Inc. was uh, funded in large part by Mark Cuban, who's media and sports mogul, so his interest was shark. Yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> in being at the forefront of, of new media on the web, so those were his goals. Whereas Best Buy was much more interested in figuring out the content meets commerce piece, uh, figuring out for them as a retailer how they need to evolve in a world where showrooming is happening on their floors every day. They wanted to get data back around how mobile affects the consumer shopping experience, uh, and so they were they were looking to us to sort of be a data point for all of those things. And actually, they're also a, a company who has started up a, a, an office in Silicon Valley. They are based in Minneapolis, which is a far cry from the, yeah, the hotbed of, of technology. But, and they're a retailer, but they're also a technology company. So they're very much interested in in being closer to the startup space and the technology space as well. Was their appetite for risk or speculation observably different? They had a much larger uh, ability to sustain the risk. Uh, you know, it was it was a large chunk of money for us. For them, it was rummaging in the couch cushion you know, <laughs> part part of their new business arm. Uh, but that kind of works both ways because. Towards, towards the end of that trajectory, uh, and I'm sure some of you know a little bit about the fate of, of Best Buy and how, they, how they've been developing or not developing so much over the past few years. So over the, the course of that startup, as their own fate was sort of spiraling downwards, you know, what once seemed like a, a promising new venture that might hold some of the answers to their own future suddenly became just something that nobody had any time to really pay attention to because they had much bigger fish to fry in later on saving their own skins. That's also true though when you're looking at like a potential for strategic investors because they may be a potential exit for you is how much do they need you? How much of an impact do you have on their bottom line? How much are you moving the needle for them? And that is tough for a lot of startups to if you're talking about these massive companies your outcome is like this tiny little percentage. And it, be, it may have everything to do with how they can innovate in the future, but if, if it doesn't, if they can't quantifiably measure it as part of their impact, you know, their fiscal impact currently, it's, it's hard to, um, it's hard for them to care. You know, about it. Could I ask a question for Bob yeah. Benchy? Was Best Buy the only strategic? Yes. Uh, and were they the only investor in that round? They were the only investor. So for, for you guys, signaling-wise, didn't the rest of the market think, hey, you know, you're going to be building something that's going to integrate with Best Buy? And, you know, what happened in future rounds? Did, did other folks come in? What was some of the perception difficult to you with? We were discouraged for a long time by Best Buy from diversifying mm -hmm. that base. And it turned out to be uh, discouraged too long because by the time we sort of shifted focus towards diversification, namely looking for more uh, media oriented partners who could advantage us in that way, in ways that Best Buy couldn't. Uh, and we, we had a few sort of partners that we had been working with and we into might unlock that piece for us, but we just ended up with the timeline not having quite enough runway to, to make a deal that would have been consequential. But there were a lot of the premise of the original uh, funding was that Best Buy was going to be able to advantage us in, in, in a number of ways which uh, 
never ended up really being unlocked. And then by the time we, we figured out that we needed to be much more aligned with media and retail, it was, it was a little bit too late. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's go back in the process a little further, since you gave us this news, Esther, that you just closed your angel round. Um, but you were bootstrapping. You've been a bootstrapper pretty much since I've known you and your other company as well, right? Yeah. yeah. What was the trigger to saying, I can't bootstrap anymore? Well, in our case, we it, it was kind of a, a classic. We just can't go on financially. Um, we weren't making any money from the product yet. We were in beta testing, and um, we just started talking to people saying, you know, we think we have we're on to something, we think um, this is a great idea, but we can't go on. So what's your positioning though to them? You can't go to them and say, hey, we're running out of money, we can't go on. That's, <laughs> that's, that's why we can't, if I would go, okay, then you can't go to them and say, we're running out of money, we can't go on. What was your positioning to them to get them to invest in a company that was running out of money and couldn't go on? Um, hey, look at what we've seen so far. Look at how people are responding to this. Um, Look at the opportunity in this space. Um, that, that's how we positioned it. Were you making revenue yet? No. Did you have customers, like beta customers yet? Beta, yes, beta testers, yeah. Did you make projections about scaling it up and, and have a, like a revenue plan? You know, um, we don't have a revenue plan with it. Uh, and so no, we didn't show that. We just showed, all, we talked a, a lot about um, how are people currently feeling about the product using it. And, He's an angel investor who knows that we have a long ways to go, and so he's really betting on our team. Um, so yeah, that's what, ha what happened. How many people did you pitch? Um, I pitched 15, 16 people. What's the first slide in your deck? Uh, our team. Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> right. So one of the earliest lessons that we learned when we went out for funding, one of the people um, that we sat down with like right at the beginning, I'm just gonna name drop now, um, was Guy Kawasaki who met us for breakfast and looked at our very, very, very first deck. And one of the first things he told us was we had put our, our team, the three of us basically, um, at, as the last slide. Like, oh, oh by the way, because we figured we were gonna be right there in the room, right? They didn't need to see our pictures and our smiling faces. And he's like, oh no, people don't give companies money, people give people money. And they need to know who you are and why they should give it to you. And the other thing that's really important is they should believe in you because companies pivot. Ideas change. Your model changes. You want them to think you're the ones to take it down that new road, uh, that you're the key, you're the special sauce. Uh, I mean, that's what you want them to think if you care about being the one who takes it. You know, Like, if you don't, that's fine. But you want them to believe in you, the humans. Um, and so leading off with who you are and why you deserve their money is really important. So, so we've actually done a little bit of a hack on that. Oh, uh, it's slightly different. Okay. So since most of the companies at Yeti Zen are actually going to be pitching at that VC level, um, and if the team is not 100% related to the opportunity they're doing, that actually can hurt them to put the team up front. But if they're not related. How? If they're 100, if they're not 100% related. So for example, we have this amazing platform play. The company, the founders have done platform plays before, just not in games, right? Yeah. So, but what is important is what people really want to know in that beginning is how passionate is the team? How much are they going to stay through everything that goes up and down in that cycle? So what we started off with is actually a creation story. You know, so hi, I'm the CEO of such and such. Let me tell you, let me tell you a quick story for you know, why I'm doing what I'm doing. And that's the opportunity to connect at a human level, you know, because most people have a very human interest-based story for why they're starting a company. It gets to show the personality of that CEO. And so it's, it's still about the people. It's still about the people, but it's not your traditional team slide. So it's a little yeah. bit of a slight flavor and a slight different hack on the people as opposed to presenting team in the way most people are used to. So yeah, this is my key developer. He's been developing for 25 years. Whatever. Right. Instead right. of that, it's like me, the founder, the CEO, the orchestrator. Why, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I passionate about this? Why am I going to eat top ramen if things go bad? And, and I'm still going to keep going, right? right, right. Why this is more important to me than, than uh, if this is my life's work, even if you know this outcome in the short run is not actually that good, I'm still going to keep going at it. Yeah, good. Good hat. Good point. So Michelle, you're a bootstrapper who's still a bootstrapper. Are you looking for funding or are you? We are not looking for funding. And um, for bootstrapping, we also my two partners and I in Squall 3, we have not put in any of our own money and we have not taken any debt. We, we just immediately started with um, 
we took on our lead developer as a, as a partner, a share in our company, and she started us building our first app, and then we started with our agency work. Um, so we, we were profitable taking in cash because we were building apps for other people. And then um, when I went to the Blogger Entrepreneurs Conference last year, it was because I wanted to talk to angels and VCs about um, we were developing white label mobile apps and we had our platform and our, our, our platform idea. And we, in order to scale quickly, I felt like we needed more money than we could take in on our agency model. And when I was talking to the angels and VCs at that conference, they all told me don't take any money that you're profitable, just keep making money and growing at the rate that you're growing. Don't take money from someone else if you already make money. I, I totally agree with that with a certain sensitivity to, I mean, Blogger was making money, we were organically growing. By the time we decided to take funding, we reached a million uniques and had 130 bloggers in our network and it was self-sustaining. We paid ourselves back the deposit on that first meeting space and never put any more money in. Although, like I said, I was, spending my own money to live, and we weren't paying ourselves regularly. But still, we probably could have kept growing organically, but we felt like we had been flying under the radar, that people weren't really paying attention to women influencers online in the market there, and that that was starting to change. And we felt like somebody could come along, a big media company that had deep pockets, and kind of try to buy what we had built organically. And we needed to scale. We, we weren't getting included in the big RFPs from companies because we didn't reach enough people. Um, so we were getting money, but it wasn't. We didn't have access to the big money. We couldn't. We couldn't take that next step, and we needed to scale more quickly. We didn't have enough people to support more bloggers in the network. We didn't have enough salespeople to go to go reach more customers. So ultimately, we thought we would be leapfrogged over by somebody else, um, and we felt like there was constraint on the market, like that we couldn't just keep growing, and that would be sufficient. Like there was a kind of inflection point where we needed to scale more quickly than we could do organically. So I think it depends on your kind of company, whether there is that, not just being the first mover, but maintaining that position. Um, sometimes you, don't, you can't sustain that if you're not growing more quickly than you can organically. Is this it also a difference between how you guys are thinking about startups? Like cash flow primarily, right? If you keep getting cash flow, keep growing, that's fine. Whereas in your case, you wanted to build a scalable startup that is going to have that really good outcome, right? Um, well, you know, then you bring me to my next topic, which is you hear this sneered about a lot, like, are you, a, are you really a startup or are you a lifestyle business? And they say that, like, lifestyle business is bad. Which is not. Which, which is not, you know. And, um, and to get VC, you better want that big outcome, right? Um, but I think we thought it was, we're going to grow to this point and then decline if we don't get the, get the money to scale, because other people will come um, dominate, you know, will come. You want it to be a company of consequence. You want it yeah. to be one of the top companies in the space. Okay, yes. Right. So yes, we did. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, so that outcome also is, I mean, however you look at it, whether you go from it this way or go from that way, you know, that's, that's uh, it's, you're still landing on that scalable startup idea, yes. right? Yes. And so if you wanted to dominate a space, then you do need money because more than the money, you need different partners who can help you get it, yes. open the doors, get you into places you couldn't get into otherwise, right? right. Um, there's a company in the city based on real estate where they have like 20 people and they've raised $18 million and everyone's like, what are you doing with $18 million? And they're like, oh, you know, because we're in real estate and all these bigger real estate providers won't take us seriously. So we raised all that cash so they take us seriously and we can keep doing what we're doing. And we're still sitting on that cash we haven't used it in the last year. So. That's a nice position to be in. <laughs> but so, Esther, let me ask you then, what strategic value is your angel bringing you, beyond the money? Uh, a lot, actually. Um, his experience in the space, um, uh, his willingness to be a hands-on partner, an advisor. So I'm actually working with him once a week for a full day. Wow. And getting that time with him is exceptional. And so that is more important even than his money is spending a day with him down in Palo Alto. Um, and Michelle, let me ask you, what, uh, I think this is a key question people wonder about. You brought on your developer as, as a co-founder, essentially. Um, right? Actually, no, we didn't bring her on as a co-founder. We, we, did, we did a sort of a hybrid. We did pay her, we pay her in cash, I mean, not in cash, but we, we pay her money for um, <laughs> developing, for the agency work that she does for us, um, for the, products that we are developing on our own, she's a partner in those products. So 
So she has equity in that. Yeah, she has equity in in our company in our in our proprietary um, apps, but in the we pay her just our, you know a regular contractor rate for our agency work. How many of you are solo like sole founders of something? Lonely. <laughs> How many of you have co-founders? Yeah. I obviously am a big fan of co-founders myself. Just, it's nice to have someone to share the good times and the bad times with, and I feel like you can be collectively smarter. And having three actually is really nice because you know there's always a majority. There's mm -hmm. three in mine as well, and we have we have very complementary yes. skills, and we've known each other a long time. We worked together at multiple companies before. Well, that's interesting because you know we didn't know each other at all. So it goes. To, so what do you think is the key to a good co-founder relationship? Um, for us, this uh, this company and our first idea grew organically out of our friendship and our conversations. We. Um, we weren't the best of friends, but we were former co-workers. We would have like this coffee and breakfast every Friday, and we're all in tech. We've been in tech since the 90s. We just talk tech all the time, and one of my partners was a partner in a wine bar as well, and that's where this our first idea developed from, but it was just that we knew, we knew deeply each other's experience, um, our potential commitment level, and we just had that knowledge of each other to begin with so that once the idea happened, and we formed a company around it. We didn't. There wasn't any sort of nervousness about who we were involved with. So there was immediately a basic trust level. And I think for maybe developing newer relationships, the trust piece is the key. And if it if it doesn't come from a you know a ten year friendship, you still need to do something to make sure the trust is there for you're going to get into this kind of business with somebody. And Esther, you work. You have different co-founders now than you did before, right? I do, yeah. So, <laughs> that's what a story? Uh, <laughs> what do you think is key to a sustainable co-founder relationship? Um, I think that it does come down to trust and um, making sure that you're aligned, and going in the right, in the same exact direction. I think that's uh, was the challenge uh, at a, a, a different company and app that launched at Blogger called Glimpse, and we. We were doing really well. We had the hockey stick growth. We were offered a term sheet with a mil for a million and a half dollars. And um, ultimately, uh, as a founding team, we just weren't headed in the same direction and ended up breaking up. And it was literally like going through a divorce. <laughs> with, the, with the term sheet on the table. Yeah, the term sheet on the table. Oh, wow. That hurts. <laughs> that does hurt. So, Sana, you probably observe a lot of founding teams. Um, as well, right? Do you see any um, consistent uh, message? That's an interesting question. I actually, what was coming to mind when everyone else was speaking, um, I did not know my business partner very well when we decided to do business together. Um, I think I hired him on one contracting project, but what really closed the deal was we actually smoked together. We smoked hookah. We smoked hookah multiple times or several weeks, and in that process, he was talking to me about business and what works in business and his ideas. And at first, I'm like, I don't believe this guy. You know, he's a little crap. Um, but eventually, I'm like, yeah, he has some good ideas. I think we can make this work. And so, um, you know, I, it's almost like a flippant thing. People throw that you should be able to drink together, and that's where the trust works. Well, I, I, I think there's some truth to that, right? If you can, um, there's there's an intuitive hit that you almost get. With I cannot I might be able to work with this person I can you know when the going gets tough I know that this is a person that I can actually talk to through all of that and there's something about the smoke that lets you pick that up. <laughs> um, I did not know that was the answer that was coming. So that's awesome. I do I'll, think, I'll think of a more serious answer. No, that's a, no. I mean that's the real answer, right? That's the good answer. I mean that's what golf is or you know smoke breaks totally. But I think you hit on something really important, which is you need to be able to have the hard conversations, not just the easy conversations. To me, there's two reasons that, that I've observed that partnerships break up. One is when someone isn't pulling their weight, and some, some, some people are working their asses off, and some people are not. And it's, it builds resentment and feelings of inequity, bad karma, bad juju. The other is when you, you can talk about all the great things and the visionary things and the awesome things, but when it comes time to we miss that number or we gotta let the, that person you hired is not working out or this other thing that's going bad or I don't agree with this term sheet, you know, and you can't authentically 
have that conversation and disagree without it becoming personal and full of recrimination that lingers and festers. And I think that's the other thing that happens. Talking every, about the bad things. I think every team has a different way. Like so, for us, we we, we fight um, really, really aggressively, and then we're fine because we resolve issues in that in that process, right? And that it's wouldn't work for okay. everybody, right? And that wouldn't work for everybody. And so people just need to be more self-aware of what works for me, what is going to make for a good partnership a deal for me, right? So so for other folks, you know, the way we we argue we fight is probably going to be too much. They, that, that partnership wouldn't, wouldn't survive a single day. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of what I see in terms of founders, right, I think there's there's a, there's this very famous book called e -Myth by Michael Gerber. Um, I don't know how many folks have read it, but if you <laughs> read it, I see some nodding. Okay. So there's this idea in there of um, being a visionary versus a manager versus a technician. And a lot of people start businesses because they're actually really good technically at something and they actually want to create a business around it because they're like, hey, that product, it doesn't work, that business doesn't do it well, I can do it much better, right? But what ends up happening is technicians end up creating jobs for themselves within their own business and they're working really hard, tired all the time, it's not something that can scale without them, right? Um, and the other extreme of that, which I think exists a lot in Silicon Valley, is this visionary, which is a person coming up with all of the ideas. And I've seen so many teams where it's a bunch of visionaries without actually having a person who can put their foot down and say, okay, this is how we proceduralize this. That problem happened, okay, how can we prevent that problem from happening again? How do we grow this as a business, right? And so, in, in our team, I'll be really honest, we're a bunch of visionaries, and we hire um, very smartly for folks who could be those procedural, those management type of people who can run with us, be crazy, like we come up with new experiments all the time and they, they actually can run with that, right? Um, and to some extent we've had to evolve a little bit as people and be able to provide enough direction so that, you know, these the team members aren't thinking, wow, I'm just, it's just the sky's always falling, there's always new things happening, right? But, but we know that, we're really aware of that, that we have this tendency to be very, very high on the visionary um, road, and we want to make sure that our operational people know that and can deal with that, and then also we give them enough support to do what they do best as, as operations. And I think that's important when you're seeking funding as well, right? Because you can't walk in there and have no way to, act. part of the process is not just telling them where you want to go, but how you're going to get there. Right? Exactly. Exactly, and so the more well thought out the operational sense is, the more people are going to have trust in you in that fundraising process. And the more, and the more, uh, like, if you can get to the point where you have revenue, if you can get to the point where your projections are based in some kind of reality, you will keep more of your ownership. You will have an easier time of it. You will be in more control. You will have more power. Um, you know, with your post revenue, if you're if you have a business plan that shows that you really understand the operational, we walked in, we didn't do five year projections because we thought anyone that says they know what's going to happen five years on the internet is kind of bullshitting you anyway. <laughs> but we had a really complete projection as far as the operating expense side of it, below the line. Like what it's what going to take. Drivers? What, and what it's going to take to really run the business. Um, and that kind of gave us a sense of credibility walking in the door um, that we really understood what it would take to run the business. Um, do you think you're going to go up? Do you want to? This is how you, how you want to do a bootstrap until you're profitable, until you grow, and, or you. Well, let me tell you something that I didn't get a chance to tell you before the panel. Um, oh. Two days ago, I accepted a new position, and I am going corporate again. And so, um, I actually I'm gonna I'm keeping my consulting clients. I'm gonna take on a couple more contractors and sub those out. So I'm gonna keep running that business. Um, Sprawl 3, my mobile business, can keep running as well. I'll be a partner, but I won't be as involved in um, the product development as I have been. And so I think it's going to keep going. But, but why are you? I This opportunity came to me um, through a referral from a friend, and it's for a large company that has that's right on the verge. It's a very traditional industry, but they're hiring a very strong um, digital team to take them to the next level digitally and I really want to be involved in in that step. Wow, this day has been full of surprises <laughs> for me. But new funding, as, new jobs. as far as funding goes, yes, we will keep bootstrapping and operating on our agency model because it's working. We're not going to scale the way that we would if we took on funding, but it, the growth is still continuous. Yeah. Any other final thoughts? Because I know we're Supposed to wrap up now. Any other last word of advice? 
Um, which, let's start that with yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would say talk to as many people as you can who are more experienced than you. They will absolutely be willing to share their information. Elisa has been a great help to me and other people that I've talked to as well. I think just continue to con like go forward, one step in front of the other. Um, some things are going to work and some things aren't going to work. And being okay with um, a measure of failure is, is acceptable. I would say if if you can, and it's not always possible, but it, no matter what sort of funding options you're considering or pursuing, if you can think about ways to diversify um, that portfolio, it could be an advantage to you later on versus giving sort of one entity enough control to uh, potentially disadvantage your, your business at, at some point. Um, so if, if it's an option for you and you can have more of a diverse uh, funding portfolio, there are some advantages there to consider. Um, I'd say be aware of who you're actually reaching out to. What do they typically invest in? What do they look at? Look at their last report um, companies that they've actually invested in. Look at, uh, talk to founders that they've actually invested in. Um, and get a sense of what are the patterns that are likely to get them interested. Um, you could spend a lot of time a lot talking to a lot of different people and you will learn something from it. It's going to be valuable. But I'm, I'm a big uh, fan of trying to hack my way into getting more exponential returns with every minute I spend. So if you're doing that pre-homework by talking to people, looking at the existing portfolio of that partner, that's going to be really, really valuable to you and save you a lot of time and get you much further along. And I always have one piece of advice I share that Katarina Fake gave us when we were getting our first round of funding, co-founder of Flickr, Hunch, Findery. Prioritize people, then terms, then valuation. Meaning, if you're going to get investment with someone, you're going to be, it's like a very, it's a relationship you're going to sustain. You need to trust them, they need to trust you, they need to get you. They need to really think you're hot shit. And then terms versus valuation, meaning never sacrifice um, fair business terms for a pie-in-the-sky valuation. Don't get stars in your eyes. Like, you will be so upset if years later you walk away with nothing because of really onerous liquidation preferences or whatever it is uh, because they dangled this valuation in front of you. Look at the business terms. you got you got to feel it's fair at the end of the day. Um, please join me in uh, thanking my panel, Sana, Barb, Esther, and Michelle.